Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the American College of Greece, at the key Paradosi and Patakis publications, I would like to welcome Mr. Richard Ford to Greece and say how honored we are that he will be speaking to us tonight as this year's Kimmel Friars lecturer. The topic of his lecture will be some thoughts about memoir. Richard Ford is, as you all know, a leading figure among American writers of the post-World War II generation, which includes writers such as John Updike and Philip Roth. With his trilogy of brilliant novels, The Sports Writer, Independence Day, which was the first novel to win both the Pulitzer Prize and the Penn Faulkner Award in the same year, and The Lay of the Land, that charts the life and times of one of the most beloved and enduring characters in modern fiction, that of Frank Bascombe, a critically acclaimed volume of short stories and a trilogy of novellas to his credit, Ford's reputation and his place in the canon is certainly secure. Ford published his first novel, A Piece of My Heart, the story of two unlikely drifters whose paths cross on an island in the Mississippi River in 1976 and followed it with the ultimate good luck in 1981. In the interim, he briefly taught at Williams College and Princeton University. Despite good notices, the books sold little, and Ford retired from fiction writing to become a writer for the New York magazine Inside Sports. I realized, Ford said, there was probably a wide gulf between what I could do and what would succeed with readers. I felt that I had the chance to write two novels, and neither of them had really created much steer, so maybe I should find real employment and earn my keep. In 1982, the magazine folded, and when Sports Illustrated did not hire Ford, which I should say was a blessing in disguise, he returned to fiction, writing The Sports Writer, a novel about a failed novelist. This is the first time that we're introduced to Frank Bascomb turned sports writer who undergoes an emotional crisis following the death of his son. The novel became Ford's breakout book, named one of Time Magazine's five best books of 1986, and a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction. As Ford said of this book, I quote, the thing that sparks creativity, at least in part, is this talk between being an outsider and wanting really very much to get in and the instrumentation by which you get in is your work. Your work is in a way compensatory for your own inadequacies as a person, for creating for yourself a sense of establishment, of credibility, of plausibility. Ford followed this success immediately with Rock Springs, 1987, a collection of stories which includes some of his most popular stories adding to his reputation as one of the finest writers of his generation. Reviewers and literary critics associated the story in Rock Springs with the aesthetic movement known as, known as dirty realism. This term referred to a group of writers in the 70s and 80s that included Raymond Carver and Tobias Wolff, two writers with whom Ford was closely acquainted. Those applying this label point to Carver's low middle class subjects or the protagonists Ford portrays in Rock Springs. However, many of the characters in the novels about Frank Bascomb, notably the protagonist himself, enjoy degrees of material affluence and cultural capital not normally associated with dirty realism. In 1995, Ford's career reached a high point with the release of Independence Day, which was published by Patakis as Imeran Exartesias, translated wonderfully in Greek by Thomas Cassis a sequel to The Sports Writer, featuring the continued story of its protagonist, Frank Bascomb. Reviews were very positive, and the novel became, as I've already said, the first to win both the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction and Penn Faulkner Award. And in the same year, Ford was chosen as winner of the Ray Award for the short story, for outstanding achievement in that genre. He ended the prodigiously creative and successful decade of the 1990s with a well-received collection of short stories, Women and with Men, published in 1997. The Paris Review called him a master of the short story genre. In 2002, Ford published another story collection, A Multitude of Sins, followed by the novels The Lay of the Land, the third Bascom novel, 
published in 2006, published also by Patakis as Ichora Oposine, translated into Greek by Spiros Tsunkos, and Canada, published in 2012, also published in Greek by Patakis and translated again by Thomas Cassis. According to Ford, the lay of the land completed his series of Bascom novels, but Canada was a standalone novel. However, in April 2013, Ford read from a new Bascom story without revealing to the audience whether or not it was part of a longer work. By 2014, it was confirmed that the story was to appear in the book, Let Me Be Frank With You, published in November of that year. The latter is a work consisting of four interconnected novellas, or long stories. I'm here, everything could be worse, the new normal, and deaths of others, all narrated by Frank Bascom. Let Me Be Frank With You was a finalist for the 2015 Pulitzer Prize in Fiction. It did not win the prize, but the selection committee praised the book for its unflinching series of narratives set in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy, insightfully portraying a world undone by calamity. A month ago, Ford published a memoir, Between Them, Remembering My Parents, a work about which we'll perhaps hear more about tonight. Bringing his celebrated candor, wit, and intelligence to this most intimate and mysterious of landscapes, our relationship with our parents, Ford delivers an unforgettable exploration of memory, intimacy, and love. In conversations with Richard Ford, the first collection of this author's interviews and profiles, editor Hue Guagliardo has gathered together 28 revealing conversations spanning a quarter of a century. This show that Ford is a writer of paradoxes. He was born in the South, but unlike many Southern-born writers of his generation, he eschews writing set in just one region. When his first novel, A Piece of My Heart, in 1976, was so often compared to William Faulkner's work, Ford disdained setting another novel in his native South. A recurring question that Ford addresses in these interviews is his view of the role and place in both his fiction and his life. I need to be certain that I have a new stimulus, he says, explaining his traveling lifestyle. Not wishing to be confined by place in his writing any more than in his own life, Ford rejects the narrow concerns of regionalism, serving notice in several interviews that he's interested in exploring the entire country. That his goal is, I quote, to write a literature that is good enough for America. Ford also discusses the broader themes of his work, such as the struggle to overcome loneliness, the consoling potential of language, and the redeeming quality of human affection. He talks extensively about his abiding devotion to language and of his profound belief in the power of narrative to forge human connections. Words, Ford says, can narrow that space Emerson calls the infinite remoteness that separates people. His novel and short stories dramatize the breakdown of such cultural institutions as marriage, family, and community, and his marginalized protagonists often, often typify the ruthlessness and nameless longing pervasive in a highly mobile, present-oriented society in which individuals, having lost a sense of the past, relentlessly pursue their own elusive identities in the here and now. Ford looks to art rather than religion to provide consolation and redemption in a chaotic time. One of my own favorite collections of critical essays is Italo Calvino's Six Memos for the Next Millennium, published in 1992. These are the posthumously published texts of the Charles Eliot Norton lectures in which he was working at the time of his death in 1985. The last of this, Multiplicity, begins with an extract from Carlo Emilio Gada's novel, That Awful Mess on the Via Merulana, that illustrates Calvino's view and practice of the novel, I quote, as an encyclopedia, as a method of knowledge, and above all, as a network of connections between the events, the people, and the things of the world. Gada, says Calvino, tried all his life to represent the world as a knot, a tangled skein of yarn, to represent it without in the least diminishing the inextricable complexity, or to put it better, the simultaneous presence of the most disparate elements that converge to determine every event. Although this may sound hopelessly overambitious, Calvino argues that it is precisely literature's duty to set itself immeasurable goals far beyond all hope of achievement, 
Only if poets and writers set themselves tasks that no one else dares imagine will literature continue to have a function. Since science has begun to distrust general explanations and solutions that are not sectorial and specialized, the grand challenge for literature is to be capable of weaving together the various branches of knowledge, the various codes into a manifold and multifaceted vision of the world. This is precisely what Richard Ford does, and he does it in a profound, moving, and exemplary way. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Ford. Thank you, Harris, very much. Um, I was I'm moved by that um, remark of Calvino's. Um, one of my most favorite remarks about the aspirations of imaginative writing um, comes from the English critic Cyril Connolly in his book called The Unquiet Grave. And, and I, I sometimes say this to, to students whom I speak to, and uh, Connolly says, the, the only true function of a writer is to, to write a masterpiece. Um, it, basically, <clears throat> if you're not trying to write a masterpiece, why are you doing it at all? And I can honestly tell you that there is, has not been a day of my life when I have set forth to write anything at all that I thought to myself, I would like to write a masterpiece. So Calvino's words, as encouraging as they are, seem to be the only words of any consequence to a writer. Why would you say? I'm just about to write this. I, who cares if it's any good? <clears throat> so thank you, Harris, again, very, very much. And uh, you know, I just want to um, tell you how grateful I am to be here. Sorry to be late. Um, I meant to be here about nine months ago. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, finally, um, <clears throat> and to meet um, Anna Patakis and to meet uh, Thomas Gassis, who I owe so much to and to thank. Katarina Thomas for being patient and, and letting me come to the American University and to receive the honor of this Friar Lecture opportunity, which for me is, is wonderful. So thank you very, very much. Um, <clears throat> it's always interesting to see which indifferent and reckless gods actually do control our lives, in this case, air traffic controllers. Um, speaking of reckless and indifferent when I was scheduled to be here last autumn, Donald J. Trump was not the president of the United States. Not that you here, where politics was basically invented, don't know plenty about heedless and absurd political systems and shabby, mendacious, and ignorant politicians. I'm, I'm, I know that you do. So we, we have so much in common, uh, Greece and the United States, the, these days. Uh, lucky us. Uh, <clears throat> coming here, and talking about memory and memoir was meant to be a relief from politics from both of our moments. Now to speak about memory is more cautionary than anything else, uh, lest we forget how precious memory is to our survival. It's through our memory, as my friend Joan Didion writes, that we retain, and I quote this, that we retain a nodding acquaintance with who we once were and how our life once was. It's when we don't accurately engage the past, which might not even our past seem interesting to us or worth engaging, or worse, when we forget our past, that we invite peril onto ourselves and devalue our own experience. It's also when we neglect the past that hollow, truthless demagoguery, such as make America great again, can start to seem reasonable. I'm not telling you anything. This is one of civilization's starting points, so you know that very well. So now let's talk about memory and memoir in the rather innocent ways that I imagined in long ago last fall. In doing that, I'm, what I'm going to try to do is make a specimen of myself for some good end. Last September, I was awaiting, uh, as Harris mentioned, the, the publication of this own little memoir, which is called Between Them which are uh, two short mem remembrances of my parents. Since then, I've taught a graduate course at Columbia where I'm professor about memoir. And what I found from writing and teaching is that memoirs, their forms, the motives for writing memoirs, even the terms of talking about them, do not submit very easily to being prescribed, except by some individual writer's conception of what her or he is doing, what she or he is doing. 
um, in a way, memoirs are much like novels in that way, though a memoir and a novel arrive, arrive at their truth differently. One by reliance on fact, the other via imagination and artifice. Somerset Mom said once that there are three rules for writing a novel. Unfortunately, nobody knows what they are. <laughs> there are also <clears throat> very few rules for writing a memoir. When I, when I try to say what it is that distinguishes a memoir from a novel, uh, the, the easiest way to think about it, I mean, you know in one way, okay, you know what a memoir is, you know what a novel is. But, but for the writer who's doing it on an individual daily basis, it's kind of interesting what distinguishes them. When you're looking at a sentence um, in a novel that you're writing, and you, as we inevitably do, you come to a, a, a point in the sentence in which you don't like a very important word. And so you say, oh, well, I've got to think of a better word. And so you look at the ceiling, and you look out the window, and you look at the thesaurus, and you try to find a synonym for the word that you want, and you think, and you puzzle, and you puzzle, and you think. And if you're lucky, you'll come up with a word that you never anticipated. And if you're lucky, you'll come up with a word that maybe doesn't even mean the thing that you thought the word you were looking for means. Maybe it's what you wanted was that the word had only three syllables instead of four or that it had a long A sound in the middle, and that's the word that you wanted. It wasn't that you were looking for a synonym, then you put it in the sentence, and suddenly the sentence is sprung in a whole different way, and the sentence means something else. What you were writing suddenly takes a turn and becomes something else, and you think to yourself, oh, how smart I am, writing a masterpiece again. But when you're doing that writing a memoir, when you're looking for that word, in the ceiling and in the thesaurus, and you come up with the word that you like very much, it has to be true. So if I say about my mother that she was exhilarated when she met a man a year after my father died, it can't be anything but what she felt. It can't be some new idea that I come up with because I happened on to the word. So whenever you, what, what I have to say is, is that true of my mother? Can I say, can I live with the fact that I'm saying this about my mother? So that level of factuality, that level of truth attained through the agency of fact is the basic difference between what is a memoir and what is a piece of fiction. It just all comes down, as it always does every day, to choosing words. I know it seems more complicated than that, but it really isn't. As Harris says, I'm a novelist. I've been a novelist almost all of my adult life, 50 years almost. Though when strangers ask me on airplanes what I do for a living, I almost never admit it. I usually tell people that I'm a retired FBI agent. <laughs> it is the same reason that when I'm out of the country in the US and people ask me where I'm from, I say that I'm from Canada. It's easier for their imaginations to deal with that than to go clankingly into the truth. I mean, when you tell most strangers you're a novelist, the complexities of that usually demoralizes them. They never know anything I've written. They don't know what I do on any given day. If I was Stephen King or John Grisham, it might be a little different, but it wouldn't be very different. Conversation usually just comes to an awful, discomforting stop. Unless, of course, somebody wants to tell me about something they've written. Everybody seems to have written something. Better, though, that I work for the FBI. It's so much more freeing than the heavy burden and heavy lifting and complexities of the truth, which is partly why St. Augustine says that memory is a faculty of our soul. Memory's truths are profound and difficult and not simple at all. Tell the truth about a human life, which inevitably engages memory, is a very complex and tricky business. In order to do this, a memoir establishes a special, protected, artificial locus for the reader, a kind of proscenium outside life's confusing, complicated onward hurdle, so that we readers can slow down and focus and concentrate and think and be precise. And not the least of real life's conceptions is that most people's lives seem rather dull and long 
and not very significant at all, both close up and far away. To tell what makes a person interesting and significant in a way that is itself interesting and significant requires considerable ingenuity and imagination and empathy. Samuel Johnson wrote, uh, Boswell said, Samuel Johnson said, that something that everybody knows, but he, Johnson said that everybody knows what light is, but it is rather hard to tell what light is. We may have an intuition about what's interesting and important, which is why we try to say it, why I wanted to write about my parents, but it's hard to say it somehow. A writer's life, if that's, if that's what I would try to explain to someone next to me on an airplane, a writer's life is actually so much duller than almost any life I can think of, being here with you being a notable exception. And yet out of that dull life can arise hugely important things. A good memoir would want to reconcile the discrepancy which says, the experience I went through wasn't nearly as compelling as the one I wrote down. Just for clarity's sake, let's try to define what I'm talking about. That is, what is a written memoir? I cribbed this description from one of my American colleagues whose name is Vivian Gornick in her quite useful book called The Situation of the Story. Gornick writes that a memoir, I'm going to quote her here now. She says, a memoir is a work of sustained narrative prose controlled by an idea of the self under obligation to lift from the raw material of life a tale that will shape experience, transform event, and deliver wisdom. You need to hear that again. A, m a memoir is a work of sustained narrative prose controlled by an idea of the self under obligation to lift from the raw material of life a tale that will shape experience, transform event, and deliver wisdom. Think about that the next time somebody sitting next to you on an airplane asks you what you do for a living. <laughs> or when you ask somebody what they do for a living, shape experience, transform event, deliver wisdom. Better just say, I'm an FBI agent. <laughs> a memoir, of course, need not be about oneself. It can be about your parents, like mine, or it can be about your life, as your wife's life and death, as Julian Barnes wrote. Memoirs are all different. There are not even three rules which govern memoirs. Some memoirs are about a place, some are about a period of time, some are informal, some are scholarly, some are essayistic, some are comedic, some are stern, some are sad. A memoir requires a subject that's personal to you and that comes out of your direct, factual, intimate experience and about which you feel a commotion in your mind. Some sort of, some sort of, some sort of rising and swelling in yourself which you cannot ignore but that demands to be written about. A memoir shouldn't be fiction, it shouldn't be made up, and it shouldn't be made up because when something is advanced to us as a fact, we who are hearing it or reading it rely on it differently from how we rely on what's in a fiction. In fiction, truth is, as I said before, always provisional and disputable. Fact, on the other hand, relies on our profound faith that events do happen, things happen, which is why Donald Trump is such a menace. He corrupts our confidence, which is based on the certainty that events do happen, and he corrupts it by lying about what happens and what did not happen. I'm sorry. I couldn't be more sorry. A memoir is also different from autobiography. A memoir typically addresses only a part of life or only one view of a longer life, whereas a an autobiography spans an entire life. I know these bare bones definitions are probably already well known to you. I don't know why I even bother. I'm normally even not much taken up with definitions. One difficulty I realize in constructing this set of thoughts about memoirs is that I don't know how you might personally feel about the memoir form. You might think like Hilary Mantel that if she says any form of memoiristic writing is a form of weakness. That a memoir is naturally inferior to the novel, that memoir is to fiction what photography is to painting. Or like my old teacher William Gass says, that memoir is a literary black sheep, a doomed form suitable for writers who only have their lives to tell about. 
or you might think memoirs are just therapy for the writer and rarely useful to the reader. Tolstoy dismissed Turgenev's memoiristic writing because it always, he wrote, pointedly, pointed to a tear in the writer's eye. He thought they were innately sentimental. My friend Mary Carr, who's written three successful memoirs, admits that self-consciousness haunts every memoir, and of course there's the recent spate of dishonored and, use, un, and untruthful memoirs, James Fry's, and Rigoberta Minchu's, and Misha de Fonseca's. All these suspicions about memoir let us know that while mem memory may be a faculty of our soul, it's also mercurial, and all the more so when you try to write about it. It may even be dangerous because of its susceptibility to being unreliable, again, to passing off what didn't happen for what did. <clears throat> By this argument, a novel is superior to a memoir because a novel, from the start, announces itself as being made up, as being freer, its wisdoms depending on the imagination and upon artifice rather than on the unstable amalgam of personally remembered and strictly factual truths. I don't agree with these disparagements. To me, memoirs can be both useful and beautiful, and also full of truthful wisdom, as well as freeing. You might say one is no less free than the other, just that they abide by different rules. But is it because I wrote a memoir and think about them and even teach them that I think sooner or later everyone is bound to write a memoir? That in our age of spiritual isolation and narcissism and communication by tweet, that ourselves are all we finally know and are interested in, that our own voice is the only instrument with which to speak into what Emerson calls the infinite remoteness that underlies us all and that Harris quoted before, so that the last sound we'll ever hear out in the cold intergalactic void is me, 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 more me, less you? I don't think so. I don't think everybody will eventually write a memoir. Most of the rest of you will write novels, <laughs> whether you should or whether you shouldn't. For one thing, as natural and instinctual as a memoir might seem, we all have a life and we all observe others' lives. It's not that inevitable a form. It doesn't come even noticeably to the public notice until Rousseau's Confessions in the second half of the 18th century, the so-called age of sensibility, when writers apparently felt a lot of stuff and decided to write about it. It may be natural for most of us to want to tell what happened to us and how it was important and what it meant, but as Philip Larkin warns us, we often confuse what's natural with what's good. A memoir is certainly a form where such a confusion between natural and good might occur as we choose to tell and what not to tell what's most important to us. Often when people invoke to us the too much information warning, which we've all heard and had invoked in our lives, it's because we have confused what's natural with what's good. Preserving that distinction between natural and good should make writing a memoir a lot harder and less attractive. As I say to young writers all the time, books you don't write are often a lot better than the ones you do. Plus, books you don't write don't count against you. Probably better to try to talk yourself out of it if you possibly can. Since I wrote this lecture to be delivered here in Greece, I thought it'd be at least polite to look for a presence of memoir in classical Greek literature. I mean, America is a new country. We're taught in school that we can achieve credibility by attributing the origins of what we're advocating to the ancient Greeks. If the ancient Greeks did it, it must be okay for us to do it. I put a reference to Aristotle in an early version of this lecture, some vague business about knowing characters by their actions rather than by what they say or think, but then I, I took it out as just being pandering to the audience. Of course, there are limits to classical authorizations. You can get into fairly choppy waters on the subject of sleeping with one's sister, as Zeus and Hera reportedly did, though no one seems to have been an actual witness to this. I did write about that subject in a novel, though, Canada, though I did not cite it when I wrote it as being authorized by the Greeks. 
One knows, though, that memory figures largely in the gods' relations to mortals. Mnemosyne is memory's personification. She's the inventress of language and words and the uses of reason, the oracular goddess of time and discoverer of things beneficial to mankind. There would seem to be a place for memoir here. Very early in the Odyssey, the goddess Athena tells Odysseus' son Telemachus that Telemachus should take charge of his absent father's memory. Build his honors high, she says. That sounds like a memoir to me, at least in a rudimentary form. And doesn't Telemachus say to her later the very words that a thousand memoirists have silently mouthed before starting to write? That is to say, quote, who on his own has ever really known who gave him life? I could have said that before writing about my parents and after. My landlord in New York is a classicist, and I asked him about the existence of memoir in 5th and 4th century Greek writing. I should say that he took my question as an amusing question. He referred to me to the Socratic dialogues as if all those supposed recountings of Plato and Xenophon and Aristippus and Leucleides were stories based on personal knowledge, or as Hume calls it, on truth history. But even I know that much of, if not most, of the Socratic dialogues aren't truth history, but are accounts full of fiction and false remembrances. Xenophon, I don't have to tell you, wrote something called memorabilia, which purports all kinds of personal knowledge of Socrates' life. But scholars now know that the writer was either not present to observe or was too young to remember any of it. Not so different from writing novels, an impulse I understand very well, the impulse to artificially create some sense of authority and plausibility where none exists. It's the novelist's obligation to manufacture a sense of authority out of one kind of artifice or another. Though again, the memoirist's source of strength is different. The memoirist's authority is that what I am going to tell you actually happened. It's fact. Xenophon doesn't qualify as a mem memoirist, memorabilia notwithstanding. He and Jim Fry are in the same boat headed across the river Styx to literary perdition. I'm sorry that I failed to find evidence of true memoir in Greece's golden age. You probably already know this too, but we have to find these things out for ourselves. But more important than chasing down origins and definitions, if we're not all destined to write memoirs, and if memoir is the subject to all these corruptions and failures, why does one write a memoir? And what are the sources of memoirs? Wisdom. How does memoir transform and shape experience the way Gornick's definition says it should? It might do just an exemplum to talk about the memoir I've written of my parents. I can try to speak more practically about memoir's origins that way and to how memoir might produce new and useful intelligence. I will, I think, say nothing more significant to you tonight than that I was moved to write a memoir about my mother and my father because I missed them after they died. I love them very much. There are two separate remembrances in this little book. I wrote about my mother in 1986, five years after she died, and I wrote about my father last year, 55 years after his death, when we might have thought, one might have thought that we would stop missing our parents and just simply concede to the fact that they were gone. But this sensation of missing them was strong and created in me an urge to write about them and to resist as if to defeat some of death's great tidal forces, one force being the force that creates emotional and physical distance that leads us to forget, and another force being the one that blurs the past and diminishes the precious particularity of individual lives and eventually submerges lives into inaccuracies that get, that get papered over by conventional wisdom and permanent misunderstandings. Memory, that faculty of our soul, will eventually dissolve into what Martin Buber calls the urge to, quote, see man as a whole unity, rather than as the individual she or he actually has always been. 
I also wanted to think more about my parents' deaths um, in a way so that I could think about their lives. To me, to contemplate death should always lead us to life. Bellows says, Saul Bellows says someplace that death is the dark backing which allows a mirror to work. And in that way, I, I think he's right. And if these are not compelling reasons to write a memoir, I don't know any. And yet there were other reasons. When you're a writer, everything that happens to you is constantly being gauged and weighed for its suitability to be made part of something you might write. It's the acquisitive way writers look at the world. Will this event, this overheard snippet of conversation, this face or that laugh or that gesture, will any of it fit into some story I might write? Everything I've ever written, including these memoirs, is the product of such ill-fitted together or well-fitted together experience rendered in language. These fittings together, of course, mimic the way we all of us make up the artifice that we call the logic and integrity of our lives. But just in the case of my mother and the quickly disappearing actuality of her life back in 1986, the urge to write truly about her seemed to ask not for the shelter of artifice that would make me want to write a novel about her instead, but instead asked a response from me that was as closely as possible commensurate with and even star starkly accurate about my mother's life, which was a small life and barely noticeable in the world's eye, and yet therefore it seemed to me was unique and possibly difficult as a subject for literature. The truth is, I should say, I never considered writing a novel about my mother. These kinds of writerly decisions get made subliminally, not usually formally or with calculation. But I have thought afterward that using fiction to depict my mother and my father too might simply have overpowered them and distorted who they really were with the machinery of the novel. One of any novel's first obligations is somehow to establish the existence and the importance of its own premise. It does this by using all sorts of complex formal strategies, but my parents already existed. They were already important to me. They were real people. They had happened. I didn't need artifice to make them real. And there was something else that urged me toward memoir. Henry James wrote in one of his introductions to his novels that he wrote at the beginning of the 20th century. James wrote that if we were never bewildered, there would be no story to tell about us. What James meant by that is that writing is often powered by unresolved contradictions that are either acknowledged or sublimated in us, but that affect us nonetheless. The integrity of what we write is often achieved by our writing's success not necessarily in directly exposing those contradictions, because often we can't identify them, but by engaging the torque, the commotion of those contradictions and harmonizing this force in some kind of written composition, the putting together of disparate things. When Seamus Heaney writes in his Nobel Address that the end of art is peace, this is what he meant by the end of art is peace. It means to harmonize the originating contradictions by writing. For me, in my relations with my mother after her death and undoubtedly in a sublimated form during her life, there were things that didn't easily fit together and that made for complications. I'm not sure I knew before I started writing what these complications were, but I knew my mother was a complex, volatile, and that sometimes was motivating me to write about her, that fact, and that it might be something quite subtle and small about her that would interest me. You can describe this sublimated sensation as I did before, and as Catherine Ann Porter calls it, a commotion in the mind. Something, Neruda calls it, algo golpeada in mi alma. Algo golpeada in mi alma, which means something kicking in my soul. Or you can say it's simply a call to language. But again, what seemed required of me to achieve true adherence to how things actually were, to the things that actually happened, 
was an utterly plain and honest way of responding, a way that was again commensurate with the plain and honest woman my mother was, not a metaphorical response composed of artifice. Oh, and what was that bewildering, con contradictory sensation? It will probably disappoint you. It may not, may not even seem like a true bewilderment, but in itself, this points to a necessity inherent in the writing of any memoir, and perhaps all things in life, the necessity of championing one's own responses to life and choosing what one will write about and will not write about. What I became aware of after my mother died was simply that she had been, for all appearances throughout her life, an unexceptional human being, not accomplished, not successful in a worldly way, not visible on the landscape, and yet in me she had created an almost paradoxically large and lasting effect. I thought that my, that my mother's and my complex affection and our outsized relationship were exceptional, but that we were not. Again, facts that don't easily go together in my mind, but that I wanted to put together and be the source of what I wrote. And because this fact represents possibly a nostalgic commonplace, a cliche, a son's outside love and estimation of his saintly mother, my mother was not saintly, it seemed to me that by closely noticing it and particularizing it factually, even stringently, I could identify a genuine human virtue, not just in my mother, not just in myself, not just in all mother-son relationships, but in all human relationships, whereby we choose to notice others. The chance to identify a virtue where something less than a virtue might be thought to reside is a good reason to write a memoir and the source of memoir's precious wisdom for us, whereas conventional wisdom and cliche are the memoirists, as, they, as much as they are the novelists, avowed enemy which is enough to say about my memoir. Near the beginning of this talk, I wondered whether we're all destined to write memoirs. I mean, there do seem to be some cultural inevitabilities in life, though maybe these only exist in the United States. One is that we will all eventually hold a real estate license. <laughs> Another is that we will all eventually sue someone and the third might be that we will all eventually find ourselves singing Blue Velvet in a karaoke bar. <laughs> a complaint, however, that I often hear voiced about memoirs, and their authors particularly, is that when yet another 19-year-old who's lived in the suburbs all of her life, never apparently experienced a cloudy day, has been loved and doted on and showered with expensive, durable goods all of her life, when that young person steps into the limelight to publish his or her memoir, almost always entitled Growing Up Weird, the usual complaint is, what's she got to write about? He hasn't lived long enough to have any memories. He doesn't know enough about the world to tell me something important. He lacks wisdom. You, by the way, don't have to be young to hear this either. But it's a natural suspicion. My own personal belief is that when someone sets off to write something others are meant to read, a crucial and necessary first question to ask of oneself is, do I have anything to tell? And can I tell it well enough that someone else might benefit from knowing it? Is it only interesting because it happened to me? Does it achieve some greater virtue, some greater value in my own case? Are my parents' lives important just because they're my parents? V.S. Pitchett has a wonderful remark, and if you want to, read his exemplary memoir, which is called A Cab at the Door, which is a paragon of the form, which answers really this very question. Pitchett said about memoir writing, it's all in the art. You don't get credit for living. So no. It's not enough just because it happened to you or because they were my parents and I'm up on this stage pretending to be a famous writer. We don't get credit just for being who we are. 
literature is important business, memoir included. The English critic F.R. Levis wrote, quote, literature is the supreme means by which we undergo a renewal of our sensuous and emotional life and learn a new awareness. Like I said at the beginning, to tell a life is an important and complicated undertaking. The requirements are considerable. From your life, you're making something for someone else where before they had nothing. And yet I remember once a long time ago when I was in my mid-twenties and attempting to write the first novel I would ever write. I knew a man, a colleague who, like me, was young and from the South. He was married with children, was an in-the-closet gay man, had just had a scholarly book turned down, and was in the process of losing his professor's job at the University of Michigan. You could say that he had a lot going on. And one day, we were sitting having coffee. It was in the pretty autumn that Michigan has, probably in 1973. And he was in a ferocious mood and had little time or interest in the likes of me, pottering away naively as I was on my novel. At a certain point, he narrowed his eyes and stared at me with supreme contempt. And I was probably 25 years old then. He said to me, you're writing a novel, aren't you, Ford? Yes, I said, smiling inanely, I am. All great novelists, he said derisively, have been hungry at some point in their lives. When have you ever been hungry? I have thought of these words many times in my long life since then. When he said them to me, they stung me to the core because I thought, never. I've never been hungry. I haven't suffered much, and frankly, I hope to hell I never do. Clearly, I have no right, therefore, to be writing a novel. I have nothing to tell the world that could renew its sensuous and emotional life and provide it a vital new awareness. I am a fraud for not being hungry. And yet, somehow, 50 years later, here I am in Greece, me and Aristotle. The novel I was writing then was to, is still in print, and there are other books behind it, including this memoir of my parents. We can all get into the sticky issue of whether or not I'm a fraud, or whether any of these books is worth anything at all, and whether or not I miss my calling by not going on to be a lawyer. You can speak to me about these matters privately, if you wish to. But you might see my point, I hope, and why, as I said earlier, I would make a specimen of myself in talking about memoir and about how I went about writing one. We should probably all ask ourselves if we're a fraud, of course, since inevitably the world will ask us that. And we should be willing to answer truly whatever the answer is. It's cathartic. But we should also realize that there are no age requirements, no qualifications observable from the outside, no uniform hungers one must experience to write something of value, something that takes strength from the torques and complications and ill fittings of a life in which the world will be better off for knowing if we would just choose to write it well. Who of us can say to another human being, you are not capable of eloquence? Nobody should say that. My great friend Eudora Welty wrote at the end of her own splendid memoir, given in those very same lectures, the Elliott Lectures at Harvard. It's called One Writer's Beginnings. She said, you can see that I have lived a sheltered life, but a sheltered life can be daring. All true daring starts from within. It's because we believe this and believe that to know another's life truly is a great gift. It's because we believe that that we're here today, whether we will write a memoir or we'll write a novel or we'll write nothing at all. It is knowledge that is, in fact, precious to us. And we are all better off if these things exist in the world. So thank you very much. Thank you, Richard, very much for this lecture. Uh, there are a couple of actually writers here in this room who have written memoirs. So your words were very, very important uh, to those who have. Maybe, maybe too late. 
Well, yeah, it's too late because the books have been published. Anyway, um, we're going to take um, three questions because then uh, Mr. Ford will uh, sign some copies. Three questions because, uh, yeah, we don't have too much time. Well, they have to be good. Yeah, they have to be good and short, not lectures, questions. Okay. Uh, so that, yeah, that's a sign of a good lecture. We don't have no questions. Ah, oh, you have a question. <laughs> and, okay, you and, uh, okay. Tell us a little, if you don't mind, about your experience as a sports writer or writer for a sports magazine and how that influenced your craft as a writer or vice versa. Did it? Well, it probably did. Um, but it didn't harm me. Um, you have, to write sports, you had to write about things that were unimportant, ipso facto, and you had to try to find a way to make what, some, what was unimportant important. And that's something that novelists are always doing. We're always coming across things which we, for some reason or another, think are worth writing or relating or putting together and we have to find the devices, the strategies for making the reader think that there's a premise here and that there is uh, reason to think that the writer will come up with something interesting and important to say. So that, I think I learned that there. Novelists in the United States, in any way, can sort of embark on the, a writing life just with the presumption that if I write it, it's good. If I write it, it's important because it's me. It, 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 Therefore, it's worth reading. But when you're writing for sports magazines like that, you couldn't make that assumption. Not only did you have an editor who was telling you that it wasn't, but you basically knew when you're writing about sports that you're writing about the toy department of life. You know, So that, that was helpful. It, it was useful to write and then see something in print fairly quickly after you did it. And what that did was it devalued and I, I don't mean this in a, in a derogatory way, it devalued publication in that, in that sort of overly precious way that writers can be when they see something published. They, they, they think to themselves, oh, I'm going to get something in, in print. And, and, and what it did was take the pressure off of the publication and put the pressure onto the writing. I mean, that, that's where for writing, for people who are imaginative writers or any kind of writers, the emphasis should be on, on doing the work. If you do the work well, it will be published. I, I sometimes tell students at Columbia when, who, who come to me and they say, oh, I'm worried about not getting published. And I say, I'd be worried about not writing something that was worth being published. <laughs> so for me, that, I, I learned that, that there. And then I also learned that, that writing doesn't have to be a, a hothouse enterprise. And that to write really serious, imaginative, long novels is a, is a lot more like writing toy department sports stories than I ever thought. So and what I did was I just took the pressure off of myself in, in a way. I could go and sit down and write something. I could go and find something out. I, ju I just found that, that it was a much more human enterprise that, than my early experience had, had, had led me to believe. Thank you for asking that because that's, that's interesting to me. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Although I just have to say, Richard, that you were lucky you were writing sports in America because if you wrote sports in Greece, that would be like writing a detective story with a bit of a mafia thing. In. <laughs> so, that would be okay too. <laughs> anyway, uh, just one second. You're going to, Familisa, she's going to ask in Greek and I'll translate. Yeah, after that, from Pisa Manic, from the Fresh. Pardon, Micro, very much. Ε, παρόλο που έχω διαβάσει τα βιβλία φυσικά στα ελληνικά και είναι εξαιρετικέ μεταφράσει, ε, θα ήθελα να ακούσω από τον ίδιο πώ είναι στα, στο πρωτότυπο ο όρο ε, μόνιμη ή σταθερή, δεν το θυμάμαι ακριβώ αυτή τη στιγμή, ηλικία που, πάνω στο οποίο βασίζεται το πρώτο βιβλίο, το, μάλλον η χώρα όπω είναι, και πώ είναι το υπαρξιακή περίοδο που είναι μότο στο. Ε, η μέρα ανεξαρτησία και αν μπορεί να μα πει πολύ, πολύ λίγα πράγματα. Αυτό ο πάντω δεν το ξέρει ο κύριο Κάση. Πώ το έχει πει, ο ίδιο το έχει πει. Καλά, μεταφράσει. θέλω να το ακούσω κιόλα. Ποιο είναι ο πρώτο όρο, ξαναπέσαι μου. 
Σταθερή ηλικία. Μόνιμη ή σταθερή, νομίζω ότι λέει η ηλικία. In the lay of the land, you have an expression called something uh, fixed age or something like that. Or permanent age. Permanent period. And in Independence Day, you have another term. Existence period. The existence period. And what's the difference between the two? And uh, would you like to explain those two terms? Um, if I can remember them, I made them up. <laughs> One of my goals as a writer of novels is to, is to try to identify periods in the arc of a human life which would otherwise perhaps go unnoticed. We all know what midlife is, or we think we do. Men are very confused about midlife, though. <laughs> Men think midlife happens at 50, which would be midlife if everybody lived to 100. <laughs> but, um, but I'm trying to... I'm trying to to, in a way, make life seem interesting. I mean, the, the goal of novels is to be about life and in the process of being about life to affirm to us life's importance so that we notice it more, so that we don't let our life get swept past us. What's the expression? The, the, the expression is, in English, the, the existence period, which is in this, I think it's in the sports writer, Maybe it's in Independence Day. And the other one is the permanent period. The, the, the permanent period is that period in life, soi disant, uh, that in, in which you will do the things for which, when you are dead, you will be remembered for. <laughs> they needn't be good things. They needn't be important things. But you're, you're on toward that part of your life which when, after you die, people think about you, their memory will only go back so far and then they'll go back to that period of which is a permanent period and that's who you'll be. Okay. Even if you, at 18, you know, invented the neutrino, nobody, nobody, will, nobody will know that. The existence period is, is that period after a calamity takes place. In Frank's case, the calamity of his divorce, the calamity of his loss of his vocation, and the death of his child. And so that he was into a period in which life, you know, um, James, Henry James says in another, in another one of his prefaces, he says, it's art that makes life. And, by, and what he means by that is that, is that art c focuses us on periods of time which would otherwise not be focused upon and which would just be running on indiscriminately. And art focuses us and puts that proscenium over it and we see it and that's just what life becomes. The existence period is that period after a calamity in which life does not have that focus, in which life is not life, life is just existence. I'm quite proud of myself for being able to answer that. <laughs> One more question. Yes. Okay. Uh, would you like somebody who knows you well to write his memories about you? Would you welcome something like this? A no, very I would simple question. I, I would, no, I would, run, I would run from it. <laughs> I, 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 I am transgressive by nature. So, no. I would, I, as I get nearer to death, I hope that I can be dead before somebody writes something about me. <laughs> I mean... Hello. <laughs> Wouldn't you all feel the very same way? Yes, we would. <laughs> uh, this gentleman has one. Yeah, we're we're going to break our rule. Uh, I love it, I love it. Uh, narrating one's past, is it a matter of making explicit the implicit, or is it more a case of articulating what lacked voice? So in... Now say that again, because I'm going to be sure that I understand it. OK. Is it uh, narrating one's past, talking about one's previous experiences, is it a matter of making explicit what was implicit, or is it a matter of articulating what did not even have a voice when it happened? Well, I would say it was not about the first. Good, okay. And I would say that it was more about the second in particularizing what happened and it may very well be, as, as I tried to say in the lecture, that the things that you narrate and particularize which did happen might have seemed, when you lived it, to be unnoticeable 
and, right. and, in, and in that way to bring the reader's notice back to something which would have gone unobserved and therefore basically tap on the reader's head and say, pay attention, pay attention, this is your life. These details are not Good. monumental. Thank you all. Cheers. Mr. Ford is going to sign some books at, uh, I think, at the entrance. Thank you. It's a wonderful. Uh